friend of mine. This day has been filled with friends and connections. Uh, Ted Snyder, who, gosh, I've known for a million hundred years. Uh, before I went to business school, he was the dean at Chicago Booth when, when I went to school there. Then he moved on to Yale, where he was also the dean of the School of Management there. And he is now a professor of economics and man management at the Yale School of Management. And Ted, you're here, you are bringing us home today. Good. So very, very interesting conversation that just wrapped up. Um, I think, uh, you know, I'll take my cues from you, Alicia. You're doing so, so much good work um, thinking about how to deal with uh, problems and changes that we know are going to come. And now you're adjusting to a new reality where we have a different starting point. Yeah. We still have the forces in place, yeah. but a very different starting point in terms of um, what's going on with this crisis. I actually would start off by saying that we, we're actually involved in two crises right now. The first one is of one, course, but two. yes, and well, early stages of two. Mm -hmm. um, the, one is of course the, the COVID-19 crisis. Um, how long will that last? Um, I don't know, you know, probably 18 months is, is the outside. It's hard to believe that it's going to be less, um, especially when you think about the endpoint being defined by when societies get either a vaccine or develop a, a society-wide immunity. Right. That's just going to take time. Uh, the other crisis, though, is, is, and is also very early stage. It's, it's, it's the economic, social, yeah health education crisis, it's, it, it derives uh, oh. You're frozen there a little bit. Are you there? <laughs> I'm sure whatever point you're making is, is a great one, but you're frozen for the moment. Oh, there you are. You're back. Crisis um, is, is the economic crisis. Yeah. Um, the the crisis in education, the crisis in, in, in our all kinds of different enterprises, uh, churches, synagogues, um, local community events, sports, everything, and that's going to have by itself huge health implications. So I think of these as ultimately two, two different health crises. Um, as I said, both are in the early stage. In the US, we have 400 deaths. Uh, that's, a, that's a very small number. Um, by reference, the 1918 flu, um, which a lot of people are going back to now, had 675,000 cases in the United States. So, um, I don't know where we'll end up in the U.S. in terms of deaths. Uh, will it be 4,000, 40,000, 400,000? Um, but just think about the fact that everybody's reacting with, I think, an understandable level of concern and panic, but we're only at 400 deaths. Right wait, now. wait, wait until we get to much bigger numbers. Now, what's happening right now um, is that the government and a lot of businesses are being forced into this flatten the curve process. Um, Wait, can, I, can I just stop you there for a quick second? Um, something that you said as we were kicking off here that I want to make sure that we don't lose in the conversation is you said 18 months. And what we're hearing a lot of by the way, I agree with that. But what we're hearing a lot of, especially in mainstream media, not necessarily economics research, is three months. Or the assumption or the hope is, oh, this will all be done in three months time. So I, I don't wanna lose that point, um, just so that we can, as, as we're thinking as leaders, as we think about our businesses and um, 
you know, and as we face challenging situations, the importance of looking at the situation as it is, not worse than it is, so that you can then create a better outcome. So three months is a whole heck of a lot different in a contingency plan than 18 months of needing to shore up my business and focus. So will you just address that a little bit and, and help us bring some context to that? All pandemic, the 169 countries and regions stayed in the United States. Um, it's, it's virulent and it, it cannot be nipped in the bud and eradicated in three months. The end point is getting a vaccine or having the virus proceed and spread and develop enough immunity among people in, in the society. I'm not a doctor, but I hang out with doctors. So that's my understanding. The three months is very interesting because I think that's part of the misconception and I would say even false hope about these efforts to so-called flatten the curve. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows about that. Right. Um, Dr. Tony talks about it all the time. We see all the graphs. But, um, <laughs> and, and I like them. Um, here's why flattening the curve has benefits, but also has costs. And the costs relate to this other crisis, the second crisis. Yeah. Why do you want to flatten the curve? Well, we know the, the, the fact that our hospitals are not up to capacity. They don't have supplies. We don't have testing. Um, it's, it's possible that if we can slow the, the growth of people getting sick in the short run, we'll have better capacity with which to deal with the people who do become infected yeah. later. But this is not a... a we end it, this is a deferral game. Right. And we may get to the point where um, that anti-malaria drug can be used to treat patients, won't stop people from getting sick, but it could improve the mortality rate, meaning decrease it. And we may get to summer, and some people speculate that oh, the virus will not spread in the Northern hemisphere mm -hmm. as fast in the summer. Um, so th that's why you wanna do the flattening the curve, right? And, and if you're a politician right now, you're like flatten, flatten, flatten. Yeah. There's, you know, who wants to oversee chaos at your local hospital? Right. But it's not gonna work. It's not going to end the virus. We're gonna be living with this virus. And meanwhile, as the governments forced, the, forced shutdowns, we're sowing the seeds of a dramatic economic crisis. You know, we had this big jump in unemployment claims, despite the offices being understaffed. Some people are saying we're going to 20% unemployment. Mm -hmm. Asset values are down 33%. Whole sectors of the US economy are really effectively shut down travel, airlines, et cetera. Um, I can't go to a bar, even though I don't go to bars anymore, but I couldn't go. I can't go to the gym. Yeah, so um, we're facing, and then schools mm -hmm. and, and churches and family activity, friends, gatherings. So this so, is, yeah. No, so Ted, so so in the face of all, because what what I'm hearing through what you're saying, and, and I, I agree with you, um, in in the component of the crises, plural, not just the one with the health, but this cascading component of the economic piece. It feels like everything, the models that we're used to, the way that we even, the way that we even used to run economic model, the assumptions upon which they're based, everything seems to have disappeared in you know in a puff of smoke and and so as we're looking at this going forward um on the one hand there's great opportunity in the fact that you know okay if there's no more of the way things work so how might we be able to make things better or what could we improve on um you know education you, you know that my opinion on this education was a model that was going to be disrupted anyway 
this is it's just accelerating that process significantly. But that that doesn't shift the fact that there's this in-between time when we don't quite have a new structure, or new way of going about stuff, and the old way isn't exactly going to work. So so what things should we be paying attention to? How should we be shaping, reshaping our thinking, business, government moving forward? Yeah, so I think the I think what what's next, there there's gonna be a turning point in these efforts to flatten the curve. Mm -hmm. They they should not continue in my view. Uh, they can't continue in my view. People are not gonna be on lockdown, stay at home. It, we already have over 80 million people supposedly yeah. obeying these orders. I, you know, I'm, I'm skeptical, but I, I also think it's just not gonna, it's not gonna be sustainable because the kind of economic harm it's doing will just grow and grow and grow. You, there's always um, a reason for everything, but I think people will realize the, the, the flattening the curve is not gonna work. So people wh whom you're dealing with should anticipate that it is going to end. Those efforts are going to end. That's the first thing. Then secondly, given that they're going to end, how do you position yourself so that you're working with local officials and being ready to reorganize business activity as soon as possible. You don't want to wait until this flattening the curve stuff just dies of exhaustion. <laughs> you, know, you should position yourself to actually um, be ready to think about, well, how would you run a gym? How would you run a restaurant? How would you think about organizing a camp for kids so that they can catch up after not having you know, much of an academic year? What, yeah. what kind of new sports activities are we going to be able to have? There are all kinds of questions that I think present opportunities. Yeah. Um, for, for businesses that are already up and running, or are already established, I should say, mm -hmm. I think one of the things that the public will want and constituents of businesses will want is basically best practice. Right. We're still living with the virus. How do we operate a gym? How do we operate a restaurant? How are we going to have longer hours and reduced occupancy? What are, we, what are going to be the protocols for employees, for suppliers, for customers? And, and working across these categories, businesses could come up with their own basically best practices and then say let's follow those yeah i think that's a that's a real opportunity yeah and, it sounds, and as we're moving on as um for those of you who are here please feel free to ask questions either in the webinar chat or in the q a bar um so i'm i'm curious so i, I really I, i'm fascinated by this idea of best practices because i think it it drives, um, or, or it, it will help solidify, ironically, sort of the, the, the crumbling of the, the walls or silos among different kinds of industries. You know, when uh, the future of work scenarios that we were talking about before, that this virus is actually, you know, accelerated into being right now, is moving away from a world of or, where, you know, or my industry does this, or your industry does it, or it's the public sector that handles this challenge, or it's a private sector. And moving into a world of and, where it's everybody needs to come together, pool resources, share best practices, in order to ensure that everybody thrives together. So, um, so as you see this, and as where if you could enumerate some of the opportunities that that might be coming out of this, um, where where do you see that happening? Yeah, so, you know, I, I've been thinking about this just in terms of everyday life and, you know, what, what, what if you have a deli in New York City? Yeah. And, yeah. and, that, and, and you know, they're, they're sort of in the gray area, right? Um, they're, not, they're not just a grocery store, which remains open, but, right. but nor are they a restaurant that must remain closed. That can you organize that activity to say, yeah, we're going to prepare foods or we're going to alter what we do 
to these new circumstances. Yeah. And, and that's the kind of you know, question that I think businesses can ask and answer themselves better than me. Yeah. But I would try to get ahead of this process because I really don't think four weeks from now, we're gonna have 80 million people on lockdown. I, I, I just don't think it's gonna be sustainable and I don't think it's the right policy because that will drive the unemployment rate to depression levels. Yeah. So at some point the governments are gonna shift focus, right? From yeah. saying, oh, we gotta flatten the curve so we don't have chaos in hospitals to realizing that we, we have to do things to rebuild um, our economy. Yeah. from which everything derives, all the good things derive. So um, I, <laughs> I think that's it. And what's that? Is it spoken as a true Chicago economist? Well, you know, there's a pretty vast um, body of literature about things like uh, health benefits depend yeah. on income at the individual level, the, the family level, community level, national level, for example. So I, I think that, you know, it's not, we can't, you know, just destroy our incomes and wealth. And I think you were alluding to it earlier, uh, Alicia. I mean, this is a totally different kind of crisis. Yeah. And, you know, I don't really know, I'm not, I'm not going to claim expertise here, but it's, it's, it's really going to be hard to deal with businesses where that don't have customers. I mean, that's, that's sort of a, a, a basic problem. And I, I think, I think businesses and, you know, other voices in society should, you know, hit your note of freedom mm -hmm. and say, you know, people can act responsibly during tough times and, and we should have the right to contract. Should we not? with somebody who wants to sell me something. If I want to go get, you know, a fitness class, a one-on-one -on -one fitness class, am I allowed to do that? Well, it's just that person and me, why not? <laughs> so I think having a voice in favor of, you know, allowing people to act responsibly, um, that's part of, you know, getting ahead of this. And, uh, but, but the responsibly part of it, it loops back, doesn't it, to that idea of, well, let's think this through and develop some practices that make sense for the moment. Yeah. Yeah. And it sounds like, um, you know, the, a theme that you're bringing up right now or, or something that you're bringing up right now is a theme that's run throughout the day, which is the importance of making uh, and making decisive, um, you know, taking decisive action now, as opposed to waiting four weeks or eight weeks or three months or however long it is, rather than sort of hiding under the proverbial yeah. rug and hoping it's all gonna go away. Yeah. Um, now is the time to act as opposed to waiting until some, you know, the, the cavalry is not coming. We, <laughs> we are the cavalry. So thinking creatively about how we can get out in front of this. And I, what you're saying also about this notion of the deli, uh, Michelle, I don't know if you were on when she was talking, but a couple of conversations ago, she was talking about how Cafe Fiorello in New York, which is a restaurant, and technically restaurants don't work as restaurants anymore, but they take the stock out of the kitchen, all those canned goods, all those supplies, and all of a sudden they're a gourmet grocery store. And they're still in business. Yeah, good. <laughs> yeah, so, so I think that's right. I think um, there'll be this interval. Suppose we date the crisis. I don't know if you want to date it. March 1st, yeah, maybe, yeah. Ma maybe we'll go for another four weeks of this kind of attempt to flatten the curve and lockdown. And then there'll be an interval between that one and a half months in to 18 months. Yeah. During which time these challenges will be presented in all kinds of settings. And I think one of the you know, things I've, you, you and I've talked about over the, over the, the years. I don't think we've known each other forever, but it's been at least a couple <laughs> of years. All I, okay, I stand corrected almost forever. Um, I think that, I think the people who do well in general, and the, but especially in times like what we're gonna start, are people who are really good at HR. 
I, I the you know, I, I used to joke about it as I started to get to know more and more successful people. It just seemed like successful people eventually became basically HR people. So, so how do you contract and organize people in, in this context? And, and I'm, not, I'm not advocating anything that probably you haven't already been pounding the table on, but I think that's indeed you know, the, the challenge. And I, I go back to the example of, well, all, there are all these kids that, that haven't had a proper school year. Yeah. I mean, wh what are we going to do with them? Yeah. Just hope that the <laughs> online education, you know, that some of them had access to, but many ignored works. I don't think so. <laughs> Sounds like a bit of a flyer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I, I, Love the, well, you know, it's no great surprise. I, I'm aligned with you and you're thinking about this. You know, I had been working on a model um, and a persona-based shift of the C-suite with some folks over at uh, PwC and looking at, you know, how do roles shift? How does the organization shift? And, um, and the role, the figure of the HR, the, the chief HR officer, you know, in these times of massive disruption be becomes, um, you know, in, in helping organizational resilience, um, extremely critical. You know, being able to help people manage their own uh, mentality around just what's happening, the crisis, and being able to be effective and active in the front of that. And then come the things like, how do we effectively engage a workforce? You know, as the folks who were on our conversation today, Holly from, um, from iWorker Innovations, looking at what the independent workforce does and how this is now combined with more traditional um, employees. It's just, it really is a fascinating moment to step into. So as we're looking um, and moving toward the top of the hour, and, and by the way, I know I've broken your seven minute uh, online conversation rule. I just um, finished, yeah, I just finished what, what Alicia is referring to is I just finished a, a class that I taught online on uh, high tech industries involved students from around the world. It was a lot of fun. Um, but I adopted a seven minute rule. I don't know, I might have violated it as well. But there's one other thing, Alicia, I'd just like to yeah. mention. I was thinking about um, people from whom I've gotten insights over the years. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I started my academic career in Michigan, believe it or not, that was even before I knew you. But uh, there, you know, yeah, so, so CK Prahlad was there and he always said, you know, just no matter what situation you are in, try to set very high aspirations. Mm -hmm. And I think that was, a, that's great. And then the other one that, that I remember from Michigan that I think is maybe, maybe yet more relevant now mm -hmm. is this idea of small wins mm -hmm. from, from Carl Weick. And a small win has, it, it it is an interesting idea. It doesn't have to be a big win. It doesn't have to be the comprehensive solution. It doesn't have to fix everything. But try something and get a visible win. It's got to be visible for it to have impact. But it can really inspire um, teams and, and, and communities. Uh, and as I said, I think in this process, you know, six weeks into the, the crisis, there, there are gonna be some opportunities to say, let's try something new and get a, get a small win. And I think it's gonna be massively encouraging to people to, to see some teams pull out these wins. Yeah. Well, I, I can't think of a better way to end our day of conversations. Um, looking for the aspirational and then now, what are the small things that you can win on in order to gain momentum behind and get exactly. people inspired by and moving forward? So Alicia, I just want to say thank you for inviting me and organizing the, the, the conversation. It helped me a lot and uh, I look forward to continuing the dialogue. Great. Thank you so much, Ted. I appreciate you sharing part of your Sunday with us and I will see you again soon, hopefully at some point in a, you know, Safe social distance. Might be on another Zoom call. <laughs> Might be on another Zoom call. Have a great evening. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.